So before we start, just a quick announcement. So our speaker for the first talk is uh, unfortunately stuck at his hostel because of COVID, as we announced a bit on Monday. So we, for the next one, be, be prepared that you will have to talk earlier, or maybe we, the, the, the schedule is a bit less tight uh, for, this, uh, for this session. And hopefully we'll have time to eat a bit earlier today. So um, our first speaker, is Frédéric, and we're talking about um, <coughs> operating system, oops, an operating system for type checking actors. Right, thank you. Let's see if I can use the microphone. Yes, maybe. Uh, okay, it's very nice to be here in person. I hope we don't all die. Um, <laughs> so this this really is a, a team effort. So I'm I'm up here giving the talk, but there's plenty of the team type of members in the audience, and, and they're very friendly and approachable. Uh, so so this really is. Uh, across Scotland, Greater Scotland, including Cambridge, uh, collaboration. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to tell you what Typos is, and I'll try to show you some examples of, of the fun we've had, and I hope that you will find it fun as well. Uh, so what is it? It's a domain-specific language for writing type checkers that we would like to have so that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot quite so often as we, as we normally do. Um, and just, of course, we're not the first one to think of this. There's many domain-specific languages. I mean, Andromeda is quite well known in this community, I guess, by, by uh, Andre and Philip and, and Andrea. Uh, but there's also all the languages in the, in the Racket community, the Red X and Turnstile Plus. And what's maybe different with our approach is that we try to minimize the demands in which you tackle sub-problems. And, and this gives some interesting uh, design uh, implications. Uh, and I think this started with, so unfortunately Connor can't be here to tell this anecdote himself, so I'll try to tell it for him. But he often uh, says that when he started working on Epigram 1, uh, he realized that with all the different elaboration problems that have to fit together, unification, etc., you have to uh, freeze something because you can't make progress anymore, and then you might have to wake it up later. And then he realized that, uh, goodness me, I'm implementing an operating system. Uh, just trying to get all of these different things to fit together. Uh, so now we're trying to actually do this in a principled way. And we started with a concrete motivation that we wanted to implement the type theory. We had a rich equational theory for free monoids, also known as lists, uh, and free abelian groups, uh, because we want to do dimension checking in our system, and the dimensions form a free abelian group. So we want to have these uh, equations on the nose definitionally so that it's easy to use. Uh, so that was our original motivation, but um, this has grown into something a little bit more general, perhaps. But I'll, I'll show you where we are towards that specific type checker towards the end. Uh, so, of course, when Connor said this, uh, me being such a pessimistic person, I said, well, can't we just do a shallow embedding and, and represent these things as functions in Haskell or something that, like we always do? Uh, but then Connor had some good arguments for we shouldn't do this, and I think I agree with him now. So, so the first argument is that it's, it's really messy to do this by hand, right? You try to reason about uh, syntax with binding, and if you do it the right way, then you just implement it once, and then it works, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Right, and, and you can use it, build on top of that. So it's nice to, to implement it once and then reuse it rather than getting it wrong repeatedly. Um, another reason is this thing I mentioned about making things go to sleep and then waking them up later. If you do that, then you might find that when you wake up again, the world is actually in a better place in the sense that some more uh, meta variables have been solved or, or you have some more information. And if you represent these things as Haskell functions, then you have no way to actually update these resumptions, right? Because they are just hidden away in a Haskell closure and you can't do it. Uh, so we would like to have a way to, to actually update the state of things that we have put to sleep and now wake up again. So, so we need some kind of first order representation. And as a happy byproduct, if we have a first order representation, uh, then that means we can actually help ourselves to do some static analysis on these things and actually reason about these things at the same time, right? So it started off with a very practical problem of how do we update uh, opaque closures, and, and then we get some nice byproducts out of it. So, so we really, we've really been helped by having the machine help us do the right thing. Um, so let me give you a very quick tour of the system we have implemented. Uh, so the first thing we have is we have syntax descriptions for the languages that we want to describe. So that, and this is really just to help us do the right thing. Uh, and because we want to be generic, we have a generic syntax. This is not meant to be something that the end user sees, but it's something that uh, we can see, write, and pass very easily. So we have atoms, const lists, 
variables and binding, and the binding is up to alpha equivalent, so we don't need to worry about this. Right? Um, and then we allow the user to restrict the shape of these things, so if you just allow any kind of syntax, that would be really hard to reason about, so we have a kind of context-free grammar language for describing these things, I'll show it to you later. Um, and we always offer a wildcard option. If, if, you, if it's too complicated to describe this in a context-free way, then you can say, okay, I give up. Anything is good. If you want to have a language of prime numbers or something, for example. Right? Um, and we have a syntax description of a syntax description. It's self-describing. Uh, so we can use this to check that the syntax descriptions are actually adhered to. Um, so, so that's the basic thing. We need to have syntax so that we can talk about everything else. And now on top of the syntax, we want to have these processes that, that manipulate it. And the, other, the next idea we have is that rather than having a judgment form, which says that, uh, well, if you have a term and a type, that then you have a judgment that says that the term has a certain type, we instead have communication protocols that specifies what to communicate. That's saying, I want the term, I want the type. And we use the syntax description to say what these what's are. And also in which direction. Is it an input or is it an output? Do you get the term in or do you spit the term out? Right. So for example, if you do type checking, uh, I think I have this example here. Uh, if you sh check that something is a type, then you just get the type in, and you either succeed or you fail. If you're trying to check that something has a certain type, then you get the type and a checkable term in, <coughs> and you succeed or fail. Whereas if you're trying to synthesize uh, a type, then you get a synthesizable term in, and you spit the type out. So, so we have an exclamation mark here to, to signify output rather than input. So we have these modes. Uh, and we can use these uh, to make sure that, that processes talk to each other in a sensible way. So this is a very basic form of sessions type like we saw yesterday, right? Uh, okay, so, so that's the, the protocols that things have to follow, but what are the type checkers? Well, we think of these things as actors. So here's another one of, uh, of these things that Connor says all the time, that a rule is a server for its conclusion uh, and a client for its premises. So now we can actually make this precise in typos uh, by implementing typing rules as actors. So if you think of a typing rule, then uh, from the point of view of, of the conclusion, you need to satisfy certain um, uh, protocols according to these judgment forms. So if you're a type checker, then you need to take a type and a checkable thing in and, and say if it's good or not. If you're a synthesizer, then you have to take a term in and spit out the type, right? So that's the the server side of the conclusion. But then you might also have your own premises, which means that you can spawn off your own sub-actors. And now you, they become the server to you, so they are your clients, and everything is dualized when it comes to the protocols. Right? Uh, so that's typically what happens. We have a certain protocol we have to fulfill, and then we spawn off child actors for, for all the sub-processes and, and hope that they do the right thing. Uh, so this is uh, the actor model of concurrent programming. And, and again, we're doing this in a very limited form, just like the session types. We're not doing the full generality. We just do what we need in order to do the thing we want. Uh, so in general, we always define an actor like this. So we say, OK, I'm going to define the check actor or the sim factor, et cetera. And I get a channel to my parent, P for parent. And that's the one I have to communicate with in order to, to send out my type or get in the, the thing. So I'll. Uh, let me tell you what, what different constructs go here on the right, on the dot, dot, dot. So we have a few different constructs for the actors. Uh, so if you have nothing more to do, then you don't have to do anything. You just uh, write nothing. Uh, winning is silent. So this is how you finish, and you're happy. Uh, failure is, is noise, noisy. Uh, so if you do want to fail, then you can always give an error message like this. And that means that, that you're really stuck, and, and there's nothing else to be done. But then you can always give an error message to the user to say what went wrong, et cetera. Right. Uh, if you don't want to, to get stuck, but you still want to give an error message to the user, then we have a print uh, actor that prints out some message text, which is useful for debugging or, or to, in the end, to say that everything is actually finished. Um, uh, we have an actor that generates a fresh meta variable. So these are the things that could get stuck. right? Uh, and these stand for unknown terms. So we give a name x for the meta variable, and we also give a syntax description for it, so we know what kind of uh, syntax it represents, if it's a type or a checkable term or a synthesizable term, et cetera. Right? Or if you don't want to do that, you could give the wildcard <coughs> syntax description. But then you don't get as much help from typos when you do things. Um, you could do a case on a term. So this is basically like pattern matching. So t is some term, and you give a list of patterns 
that can include variables, etc. And you say that if if t is a lambda, then I want to do that. If t is um, an application, I want to do that, etc. Right. So we match the term against the patterns, and we continue as the first one that matches. Uh, but if t is a meta variable, then you're not allowed to, uh, to match on metas. Right? Meta means we don't know what it is yet. So this is how we can block and and stop making progress because we don't know what term is going to be instantiated for the meta variable later. Um, so uh, the other thing we can do is we can fork into two different actors that run concurrently. Uh, so we continue as A and B in parallel. And uh, progress in B might make it possible to continue in A. So if A is blocking because there's a meta, but B solves the meta variable, then A can continue. Right? So, so this is how we can uh, make progress and, and actually solve the meta variables. And how do we solve them? Well, uh, we have a unification actor that takes two terms and tries to unify them together. So if there's meta variable in these terms, that means that we are going to know, learn some more information about them. Um, right, and finally, we can spawn uh, child actors. Um, so we, we spawn a new actor, for example, if I want to synthesize something, I can spawn a sim factor. And I make up a name for a new channel, and I can use that channel to communicate with, with my children. Right? So I can either send a term on this channel, or I can receive a term. Right? And of course, these messages sending and receiving, they must conform to the protocol that we had. And we can check this statically so we don't forget about uh, any, anything. Uh, well, what else can we do? Well, we can bring fresh object variables into scope. So I can make up a new object variable. This is not like a meta variable. This is something that uh, lives in the object language is not going to be solved in the end. It's just a variable that you talk about. Uh, and we can extend context with information relating to object variables. So I would declare a context uh, CTX, that's a name for it. And then here, if this is an object variable, then I can say I want to associate this information with it. So for example, if you're doing type checking, then you probably want to associate the type to all the variables. If you're doing evaluation, then you might want to associate a value to all the variables, et cetera. Right. Yeah. So that's a way to do. After you've extended uh, with a fresh variable, then you want to extend, say what, what relevant information is, is associated with it. You do that with this, with this actor. Uh, right, and this is how we look something up in a context. So if you have a term t, and if it's a variable, then we try to look it up in the context that we declared. And if it's declared in the context as T, then we continue as A, otherwise we continue as B. So I think this will become clearer when I show you a full example in a moment. But, uh, but this is how you extend the context, this is how you use the context. Uh, right, so here is a full example for uh, the type checking actor and the synthesizable. So let's see if we can talk through it. Uh, I didn't think of this. Uh, Maybe I'll try to stand here. So, so we see that we have a check actor and a sin factor. And if you look at the check actor first, it's first receiving a type and a term, these two, because if you remember the protocol, it was supposed to receive a type and a term, and then win or fail. Right. Then we do a case on the term, and we see if it's a lambda or if it's an embedding of a synthesizable actor. If it's a lambda, then we can pattern match on the body, so we know that it's binding an X, like this, and then there's a body. And next, we make up two fresh meta variables, S and T, uh, of syntax category type. And we constrain the type we got in to be an arrow type from S to T. And at the same time, we make up a new fresh object variable X. We extend our context to say that X has type S, and then we check the body. So we spawn a check actor with uh, channel Q, we send it the type T, which is the type we expect the body to have, and then we send it the body to check it, right? So that's going to spawn a new thing, and, and that's going to go away and do its thing. And similarly, if we have an M, then we're going to call the synth and, and do the synth thing. Um, and the synth one is similar. So the synth is supposed to get the term and then return a type. So we get the term, then we check if this term is a free variable in the context, with this if in context uh, construct. If it is, then the S here is the thing we looked up, so that's the type we stored in the context, so we just send that back, and then we're done. Otherwise, we do a case on the term, so now we know it's not a free variable, so it could either be an annotated term or an application. 
If it's annotated, then again, we go back to checking mode. If it's an application, then we do something similar to the Lambda case again. We make two fresh variables, S and T. We immediately return T, so we can do this before we've done the other things. And then in parallel, we check that the F and the S make sense. Uh, and that's a choice we have. We don't have to immediately run T. We're just doing that to make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, but otherwise, we synthesize a type for the function by spawning a sin factor, sending it F. We get back its type. We constrain the type to be an arrow type. And at the same time, uh, we check the body. So we spawn a check actor. We send it the type S to check, and we send it the little s, the argument. Right. So that's how you write the type checker in this language. Um, and how do you execute these things? Well, uh, we currently run them on a stack-based virtual machine. So, so we set up a stack, and then, then we run different things. And we run the first, if we have a parallel thing, we run the first one until it gets stuck, and then we run the second one, and then we go back to the first one, et cetera. So we're not actually do, doing this concurrently at the moment. That's something we want to do later. Um, but the fun thing about this, right, and meta variables are shared, but that's okay because they are monotonically updated, like I said. It just, the world can only get better. You can't, can't back into a corner and make a mistake. Um, and the fun thing is that after you run this, you can actually look at the, the remnants of the stack and derive a typing derivation from this. So I think that's really cool. So I'll show you this in a second. But um, let me show you some examples of this. This is the example I just showed you, except here we have the syntax declaration. Uh, yes, sure. <coughs> uh, so here's the syntax declaration. Here are the uh, judgments. Here's the implementation I just showed you. And then here I'm now executing this actor. So just to make it a little bit more fun, I'm not going to execute a full, act, a full example, but I'm going to have a meta variable u, which is a type, and a meta variable little u, which is a checkable term. Uh, so what I have here is not a complete program, but, um, uh, but something with holes in it. So now I want to check that uh, this term here has this type. So I spawn a check process. I send it the type to check. It's an arrow from not to not. And I send it the term, which is a lambda of something, something, and if I comment this out. Okay, something like this. So we see that the body of the lambda, the inner lambda here is a meta, it's unknown, and the annotation type here is also unknown. But if I now run this, uh, I get the parse error, of course. Uh, right. Why do I get the parse error? Uh, right, if I run this, then I'm not sure if I can get, make this larger, sorry. But we see that we have one warning about an unsolved method being stuck. That's the little u. Uh, so what happened to the big u? Well, if I try to print it. So I want to instantiate it fully, so I use uh, an i here, and I want to print big u. And now I'm going to get my parse error again. Uh, okay, so then we see here when I print it, we see that we've actually figured out what the type is just from all the other constraints, but we're still stuck with this body u. Uh, so we can also constrain that explicitly. So if I say this is sac of zero, for example, uh, then I get a parse error. Uh, well, uh, well, we, we only have full stops when we do something after it. Oh, I think I just need some brackets around this. Because of the right, so now we see that um, we ha don't have no unsolved metas anymore. Right. Okay, so let me show you the derivations quickly. So if I do a dash dash latex, and then I give the file name of some latex file, uh, then, and I run this latex file, then I can generate <laughs> this derivation. Uh, so we see here that, oh, 
we see here that that little u is still here, so this subderivation is not completed, right? Whereas uh, if I did that, then we see we have ticks all the way, so all of the whole derivation has now been fully, and, and that's all implicit in the, sta the state of the stack at the end. Right? Uh, we can also animate this if I do latex animated. Uh, so you can see how we build this up step by step and see w which parts of the program we did at which time. Uh, so we see that we build up and then we go down with all the ticks in the end. And since I have a tick here at the very end, I know that I have a complete derivation. Uh, so let me show you very, very quickly. Just one more example. Uh, so this is the example of evaluation of untyped lambda terms. So we have untyped lambda terms, lam lambdas or applications, and we have an evaluation judgment which takes a term in and spits the term out. Right? And let's not worry too much about the implementation, perhaps it's just doing the very stupid thing. And in particular, here when we evaluate a uh, an application and we found that the function that we apply is a lambda, then we just evaluate the body, but we substitute uh, the uh, argument, which was the u, which we evaluated the s2 for the y in the body. So we have this substitution in, and if we forget to do that, so I don't do that substitution, uh, then typos is going to tell me off that the scopes are not right. So this is really helpful for, for actually getting this right, because it's really hard to forget these, uh, easy to forget these things otherwise. Uh, but okay, if I do that, and if I generate the trace again, okay, so that's the ASCII version of the trace, but I could also look at the tech version, and I just redefined some of the notations a little bit so that the lambdas are not the tagged lambda, but an actual lambda, etc. So I prepare that, and now if I view this, uh, then you see something like this. <laughs> so you get, I mean, it's really satisfying to have these big traces, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so what do we get by construction? Well, we get that from the protocols, we get these uh, contracts, rely guarantee contracts, that we do the right thing. Uh, the fact that actors only know the very variables they create means that we st everything is stable under substitution by, by construction. Uh, the fact that we have schematic variables that have binding site means that we don't escape the scopes, like we have said, and we get many more things. So in the future, we'd like to see what, what more interesting properties we can, we can get by construction. But I think it's time I stop here, so thank you. We have time for a few questions. Unfortunately, Pierre-Marie is not here, so I have to run myself. <laughs> yeah, uh, very cool. Um, I was wondering, so in uh, implementing a conversion check, for example, you would want to have a shortcut rule maybe that does a syntactic equality check. So for that, you would have to do some kind of uh, backtracking. So is that supported by TypeOS or Not having multiple rules for the same constraint? At the moment, we don't support backtracking. We are quite keen on not having to do search. Um, right. which is or some restricted form of backtrack. So you want to try some something quickly. If this works, then it's, uh, then it's yeah. all good. And otherwise, you do the normal procedure. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that's a good suggestion. And of course, we thought that we might need this in the future. But so far, we've, we've taken the performance hit of, of not doing it. But maybe, yeah. We, right. we, Maybe we need it eventually. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, <clears throat> so it's a domain-specific language, but uh, you certainly considered uh, just having uh, EDSL maybe in Haskell or something like that, like a, a monad which has all these uh, these services that you described. Uh, can you say um, whether this would be possible or why why you chose to make it really a whole new language. Yeah. I think it wouldn't be possible without a lot of trickery and, and some hidden state or something, right? Because the, the thing we really want is we want to have these, when we, put, when we 
say, OK, you can't make progress anymore. You, you go to sleep for a bit, and then I try and run this other thing. Then when we wake this up again, then the state has changed, and we might know more meta variables. So maybe you could do that with global, global state or something like this, but in idiomatic Haskell, that, that's just not possible. Right? Yeah, indeed. I mean, in Acta, we also have like uh, this kind of uh, postponement um, mechanism and waking up mechanism and all that is uh, horribly complicated. So yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah I guess it's, uh, it's a nice idea. Thanks. Um, I was wondering about what you said on the case construct that you cannot match on meta variable. So you cannot have something that says, yeah, if like the result of an evaluation, for instance, is a meta variable, then I have to do something special. And if it's a real constructor, then I can do something else. Uh, that's right, yes. Okay. Because basically, if you could match on metas, you would absolutely not be stable under substitution. Yeah. Right? Okay. Because being a meta variable is not stable under substitution. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, perhaps a related question to what Andreas asked. Um, did you consider taking an existing actor system for this, right? Because you have a few constructs which are specific for type checking, but uh, the state and blocking they already exist uh, in, for example, Akka and whatnot. Um, or if, if you did, right, then why do you decide to go with this route in the end? Uh, so I think that that's something we might want to do later when we really have a concurrent implementation, that that would be the obvious way to do it. But for the first implementation, we wanted to have something we could understand ourselves and something we could hack on. And now we have some kind of reference implementation, and we can compare that to the concurrent one. Okay, so thanks a lot.